Good morning. Welcome once again to the Tuolumne and Soulsbyville United Methodist Churches online. For those who've been following the news for our county, uh, we've already had over 90 new cases in Tuolumne County this week. It looks like we're going to continue to go backwards and see bigger restrictions. Um, so what does that mean for being able to add in-person worship? Be patient. And it looks like we're going to be really pushing our patience for a little while, well, for maybe quite a while longer. That's uh, just the way things are. Um, we want to love our neighbors. We want to share God's word, but we want to do it in a safe and responsible way. Continue uh, to watch your email. Um, we're getting prayer concerns coming several times a week. Um, keep praying for one another, our community, our nation, our world. Um, there's a lot going on and, and a lot that needs our prayer. Even if we can't be together praying, we can be sharing our prayers and, and, and lifting them up from our homes. We continue with our worship. Good morning. We're reading out of Psalm 76 today. In Judah God is known, whose name is great in Israel, whose abode has been established in Salem, whose dwelling place is in Zion. There God broke the flashing arrows, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war. You are glorious, more majestic than the everlasting mountains. The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep. All the soldiers were unable to use their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. You indeed are to be feared. Who can stand before you when once your anger is roused? From the heavens you utter judgment. The earth feared and was still, when God arose to establish judgment to save all the oppressed of the earth. Surely human wrath shall praise you. The residue of wrath you will gird upon you. Make vows to the Lord your God and keep them. Let those who surround God bring gifts to the one to be feared, who cuts off the spirit of monarchs, and makes the rulers of the earth afraid. God bless the reading of his word to your heart. Amen.
parable of the talents, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents of money, to another, two talents, and to another, one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done and good and faithful servant. And you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered See, Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to one who has the 10 talents for everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I invite you to join in a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, may all of our thoughts and our feelings, the meditations of our minds and of our hearts, and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, I, I count myself as fortunate, having a pension, seeing those funds just slowly grow and going to be there, hopefully, you know, that I'll be able to retire securely and um, be able to do ministry in a different way at some point in my life. Quarterly reports. They, only about four times a year do I have to worry about what the, the Board of Pensions is doing, investing my money. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. 
it, you know, the, the boy, what a volatile roller coaster the investment market has been. It, it, it seems like one day the stock market is just crashing and everybody's worried or, or, or we might lose everything. And then a few weeks or a month later, the stock market is outperforming and recovering better than you know what most families are experiencing right now and if you think it's wild now it was even wilder in Jesus day but you know we're getting to the end of the Christian year and once again we have Jesus teaching about us being prepared for the coming of God's kingdom and this time he used the parable of talents, a, a story about investments. In today's gospel reading, Jesus tells a story about a man with some money. He turns this money over to three financial advisors. Well, in the story, they're servants. But when you hire a financial advisor, they work for us, right? And there are servants, as it were. And so the client, the master, gives three people the opportunity to make some money, to get the best possible yield. And of course, the client is going to be very happy with the one who gets him the most money. So, what happens? Well, to recapitulate uh, briefly, the, the businessman had eight talents. Let's say $800,000. So he turns to his first advisor and he gives him 500000 And the second financial advisor, he gives 200000 And then he, he gives the third one 100000 this distribution, the Bible says, is in line with their abilities. In the opinion of the client, called the master in the text, thus the client diversifies his portfolio by, by taking that $800,000 and dispersing it into, into three different piles, three different financial gurus. He has a really good feeling about the first guy and gives him that, that big amount, the 500000 and and smaller amounts to the remaining two financial experts. He's confident that when he returns from a long trip, one or all of his investment bankers will, will produce a return for him. You know, it was a good strategy. When he left, his portfolio was worth 800000 And when he returned, the value shot up to $1.5 million. The first fellow got into trading and doubled the client's investment. The second did the same with, with his 200000 Well, the third banker, being no genius, and he was very risk-adverse, he simply held his client's money in escrow. Well, a hole in the ground. And he returned the principal. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. It was a wash. And the client, well, the client was not happy with this third guy. And he fired him right on the spot. And he called him worthless and probably some other names that don't translate real well from Aramaic. The authorities were called in. And the fellow was, was thrown into the outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Huh. So what, what if we were Jesus' financial advisors? We are, you know. We are stewards of what the Lord has given us. And we are responsible to use what God has given us in a way that will increase the principle. And this is especially 
important in light of the urgency of the times in which we live. The master of the text was taking a trip. This was crucial information, and Jesus knew that likewise, well, he was going on a trip. And someday, God the Father would send him back, and there would be a settling of accounts. And this is why the story, the first two advisors, servants, traded the master's talents immediately. They, they didn't want to get caught empty-handed when the master returned. It could be just any time. And their wisdom was richly rewarded. What's that look like today? The, the stories told about a team of, of engineers who worked for Thomas Edison in his laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. For many months, they pursued a line of research that ultimately led nowhere. It started out promising, but then it just turned into a blind alley. In fear and trembling, they went to see the boss, just to go confess their, their failure. And, and Edison surprised them and congratulated them. True, they had come up with no useful invention, but they had increased the scope of human knowledge. They'd eliminated possibilities that would in the future allow others to direct their own efforts more effectively. And most of all, they fulfilled their assignment. They had not buried their talent in the ground. They had risked much in the quest for great reward. You know, the problem with playing it safe is all too often that means we're just not playing at all. We just put ourselves on the sideline. You know, the call goes out in the church for people to, to pitch in and to help in some way, and either financially or, or, or by exercising our spiritual gifts, and, and too often that voice of caution in our head wins out, and, and we listen to, oh, not me. Oh, I couldn't do that. Or, or there's the other popular variation. Not now. It, it's just not the right time. And, and always to these show-stopping objections, there, there are just two simple questions. If not me, who? If not now, when? John Ortenberg, in his book, I love the title of this, is, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. Uh, he goes on to reflect, Fear and growth go together like macaroni and cheese. It's a package deal. The decision to grow always involves a choice between risk and comfort. And that means to be a follower of Jesus, oh, you must renounce comfort as the ultimate value of your life. And, you know, that's sobering news to most of us because, you know, we're kind of into comfort. Hmm. Think of all the things in life we miss out on because... We are afraid. We don't trust God's goodness, God's promises. Think of all the opportunities that, that we could invest with, with, with our God-given talents, opportunities if we were just bold enough to base our goals and our priorities on God's promises instead of our own security. You, you, you may have heard of, of Amy Purdy. She was just a typical 19-year-old with a bright future, and she came early, early 
from work. She came home and wasn't feeling well. She thought she had the flu. She woke up from her nap and her, and her hands and her feet were numb and they were purple. Her blood pressure began failing. She was rushed to the hospital in cardiac arrest. Amy had contracted what was often a fatal form of meningitis. And the nurse who was attempting to, to put the IV in her arm, you know, she could be overheard saying, well, Amy only had a few hours to live. When Amy awoke from a coma, her doctor explained that, that in order to save her life, they were going to have to amputate both her legs below the knees. Imagine being 19 and having your life suddenly and radically altered by something outside your control. Hmm. We went through a slower process of life-changing scenario with Jamie. Not maybe a few years younger than Amy. And, you know, we, we all, we all have have these moments where they come on gradually or, or suddenly. And fear, fear, isn't that the natural response when, when we're losing control uh, of our situations? But Amy, Amy faced her new life with determination. She wasn't going to give up, even with, with no legs below the knees. She tried to, to return to snow, snowboarding. You know, it's one of her favorite hobbies. But, you know, she just couldn't get the prosthetic legs uh, to, to fit that would allow her to snowboard very well. So Amy did a lot of research and partnered with a doctor who provided her with prosthetic legs and created new prosthetic legs that were designed to snowboard. And she became the first woman to win a bronze medal in the Paralympic Games. Amy Purdy and her husband also founded Adaptive Action Sports, an organization that helps athletes with disabilities to participate in the sports that they love. Amy even competed on Dancing with the Stars, and she has had the opportunity to share her story on television and at major speaking engagements. Amy says that when she lost her legs, she had three goals. I'm never going to feel sorry for myself. I'm going to snowboard again. And that whenever I figure this out, I want to help other people do the same. And, you know, that's exactly what she did. Her sports organization helps athletes with disabilities to reach their full competitive potential. Her best-selling book and speaking engagements inspire people who have unexpected losses. Amy Purdy's challenge, well, she could have just rolled up into a little ball and just felt sorry for herself and, and, and given in to fear watching out for her own safety and comfort. Instead, she's investing her life in helping others. She's pursuing opportunities to do good works. Another, another story. Robert Young was a successful businessman. He lived in Seattle but was on a business trip in New Mexico and he, he noticed a headline in, in the local paper, Elders Freeze to Death. The news article detailed the crushing poverty of local Native American living on the reservation and the horrible living conditions of many of the elderly Native Americans. Robert couldn't explain why, but that, that story just touched his heart and, and, and wouldn't let go. And a few like weeks later, when Robert learned about the Adopt a Grandparent program for Native American elders, well, he called the, called the number up and, and signed up. And it, Robert was paired with a 78-year-old Native American woman in South Dakota named Catherine Redfeather. 
Catherine welcomed Robert into her family as her newest grandchild. And in spite of her poverty, her letters to him were full of joy, proudly sharing the news of her large family. And when Robert asked Catherine what was there that he could send her, she asked only for a bottle of shampoo and some aspirin. And Robert couldn't imagine living in such poverty that shampoo and aspirin were luxury items. He determined that he was going to visit Catherine Redfeather and see her living conditions for himself. And Robert and his wife Anita were, were just so shocked by the, the poverty they saw on Catherine's reservation, and they were humbled by the joy and love of Catherine and her family. When he returned home, Robert just couldn't get any satisfaction in his work. He worried all the time if his adapt, adopted grandmother was safe and warm and, and had everything that she needed. That summer, Robert... Anita and a handful of friends while well, they traveled back to South Dakota and to build a house for Catherine. And as news as the project spread on the reservation, Catherine's family and friends showed up to help, and they had a big celebration when the home was complete. Now Robert could relax, get back to his ambitions and his successful life. You think that's right? Uh, you know better than that. God had put a new vision in Robert Young's heart. And he just couldn't bury his talent in self-interested pursuits. After a lot of research and thought, Robert Young, well, he sold his half of his successful business, and he and Anita moved to Boisman, Montana, and they started Red Feather Development Group to provide affordable, secure housing for Native Americans. Often, we forget that our purpose on earth isn't just to take up space or to, to fill our barns with grain or line our pockets with cash or take it all for our own use and our, our personal glory. You, you remember the, the parable of the rich fool? Some folks don't understand investing for Jesus. Others, like Amy and Robert, well, they've gotten it and they've done it very well. The Bible says that we should take time to worship with others. Love our neighbors, in other words, invest in people. Focus on our spiritual gifts. Be kind and helpful and demonstrate hospitality. Why doesn't that sound like a good investment plan? Five, five simple points. So, it's time for a checkup. How are you doing? Investing what God has given you. Amen.